It is a pleasure to be back at Apple Creek. Some of the nicest people I've met in my entire career, I met them at Apple Creek. I hope they are still nice. But I'm delighted to be in your house, and I bring you greetings from my house. The Hope Seventh-day Adventist Church will receive greetings from my house to your house. It's, it's a joy to be here. That was an amazing song, amazing song. Michelle, I always love hearing you sing. I wish you could be a member of my church to sing with the others over there. I want to thank Sister Trail for making that contact and affording me this opportunity to stand here today in front of this August assembly. You are looking good. God is good. I want to thank the pastoral staff for affording me the opportunity to stand in this desk today. It's an honor to be sure. I would also like to acknowledge the support of my gorgeous wife who is here today along with my son Jaden and Akilah, I'm going to ask them to stand so that you can be reminded as to what they look like. And also my uh, mother-in-law, Carol Myers, is in the house. I'm going to ask them to stand. Amen, church. Amen. May be seated. They've asked me today on this health day to do a number of things. And within the next 30 minutes or so, I will share with you from the passage that was read by that young gentleman who read the scripture so competently. I ask of you now, therefore, to go with me to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 4, and I want to read verse 8 and verse 9. What book did I say out there? Genesis and chapter and verses 8 and uh, 9. And the Bible says, And Cain, and who? And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and kissed him and hugged him, and slew him, the Bible says. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel, thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? I would like to challenge your mind on the theme, my brother's keeper. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, I am now in your hands. Uh, this sermon is in your hands. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord. Our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. We are all intricately woven together by the fabric of humanity. Maria Bessadin, former graduate psychology student at Fordham University, Bronx, was brutally raped in a Queens subway station on June 7, 2005, two days before her second birthday, while two MTA workers looked on. Bezalin's ride through hell began on a Queens-bound G-train when a psycho, the only other 
person in her car began touching her feet. She jumped away, but in the commotion missed her station. Greenpoint Avenue in Brooklyn. She got off at 21st Street in Long Island City, bolted up the stairs with the men chasing her. At the top of the stairs, ladies and gentlemen, she tried frantically to signal to booth worker John Court with her eyes that she was in desperate need and she was in trouble. Court, however, did uh, not leave the station. The rapist grabbed her and pulled her by her neck, dragged her down the stairs and sexually assaulted and violated her several times on the stairs and at the far end of the deserted platform. When a train pulled up into the station, she again hoped she hoped her ordeal was over. But like toll booth worker, John Court, conductor of Har Harmodia Cruz, did nothing to help her. As a result of this terrible act, Bessadin dropped out of her graduate program and she struggled with depression. She struggled with post-traumatic stress. She struggled with anxiety. Human beings, Apple Creek, are not supposed to be this cruel. Am I right about it? It was Franklin Roosevelt who once said, if civilization is to survive, we must cultivate the science of human relationships. The ability of all peoples, of all kinds, to live together in the same world and at peace, unquote. It is, it is, it is for this reason that the pertinent and thought-provoking question posed to Cain now begs our attention. Are you still with me? Are you still out there? Allow me, therefore, to make three points from this ancient tale, and then I will get out of your way. First, I would like to answer the question, am I my brother's keeper? Second, I would like to talk to you about our responsibility as our brother's keeper. And third, I would like to talk to you about the result of being my brother's keeper. So first, let's talk about or answer the question, am I my brother's keeper? It was, it was probably about a week after this heinous crime of murdering Abel that God walked up to the victim's brother Cain, who, ladies and gentlemen, sat defiantly, defiantly under a tree somewhere, eating his grapes and his bananas that he harvested from the field. God walked up and walked over to Cain and looked him in the eye and posed the thought-provoking question, where is your brother? God, of course, knew where the brother was. He was been murdered and buried in a shallow grave somewhere. So the question is not for God, it was for Cain. The question is not for Cain, it's for us. The question is not for us, it's for you. The question is not for you, it's for me. Where is your brother? Can I hear somebody say amen? Not who is your brother. 
He knows that. You see, we are, we are brothers. Hmm? Hmm? If you notice, we say brother and sisters out here. We are brothers and we are sisters. Am I right about it? You see, a brother is not just one born in your family. Am I right about it? A brother is not just an offspring. Not just one related by birth. When, when used in the New Testament, the word brother, Adelphus, includes one having the same ancestors. We're all cut from the same piece of cloth. Humanity. Adelphus means one belonging to the same race. A fellow countryman, which includes your co-worker, the male man. Hmm? The cashier hmm? at the grocery store. The man that works on your car. Uh, those who you come in contact with every single day, regardless of race, color, sex, or creed. We are brothers. God is our father. Jesus is my brother. And somebody says the Holy Ghost is my mother. We are brothers. Where is your brother? Is a question that, that Cain knows the answer to. He, ladies and gentlemen, did not deny that Abel was his brother. He just, he just responded with a stinking attitude. Hmm? Uh, uh, in the words of uh, Zig Ziglar, he had a, a stinking thinking. Mm. There are a lot of people, he, including church folk, who, who have a stinking thinking. Everything is, is negative. Everything that the board comes up with, we can't. Every, every dream that somebody shares, we can't. A stinking thinking. I don't live in a house called can't. I believe that we can. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Somebody ought to say amen. Now, the brother Cain gave a rather flippant and arrogant answer. Hear what he says. He says, I don't no. Am I my brother's keeper? He's talking to God. Is that how you talk to your God? Adam and he, when they sinned, they hid themselves. But here is the brother sitting arrogantly looking at God and, and talking back to the Almighty who put the bread in his nostril. If I were God, I would take it back. What an amazing God we serve. Somebody ought to give him some praise up in here. The New Living Translation says, he says, I don't know. Am I supposed to keep track of him wherever he goes? In other words, am I supposed to follow him around every minute and know where he is? He's not my responsibility. He's yours. This brother is rude. He's being evasive. He's trying to avoid the question and he's being nasty with it. Mm -hmm. Still there? He has an attitude problem. He has a way of showing up in the Seventh-day Adventist church with a I don't care attitude. Mm -hmm. He's callous. Mm -hmm. He is disrespectful. Uh, he has a sense of entitlement. I was here when the church started. Mm hmm? He has a nasty disposition. 
He, he will hate you. He will curse you out. In church, he will tell the pastor where to go. And it's not heaven. But God, with this interrogative question, seeks to provide, seeks to provoke, rather, the humanity in him. You see, within the worst of us, there is the best of us. And within the best of us, there is the worst of us. That is why I don't talk about us. So God tried to provoke the humanity in him, but he flies in God's face. But God still stood there. For even though he has committed murder, God still loves him. Even though he has committed adultery, God still loves him. Even though he's on drugs, God still loves him. I'm glad even when nobody loves me, God loves me. I'm glad when people wrote me off, God loved me. Come on, somebody say amen out there. He's an amazing, an amazing God. So where is your brother? Is an introspective question, not just for Cain, but for all of us. Because yes, I am my brother's keeper. We've all been cut from the same cloth of humanity and stitched together by the thread of God's love. This makes you and it makes me brothers and sisters. The next thing I want to address is our responsibility as our brother's keeper. Is it still there? At first, I, I, I hear someone asking, what does it mean to be my brother's keeper? I'm glad you asked. Does it mean taking responsibility for someone else? Does it mean, like Cain thought, following, following him around all day and keeping track of what he does? Does it mean making decisions for others who are in trouble, bailing people out all the time of their problems? Not at all. Instead, ladies and gentlemen, we are to assist in helping people carry the load. Hmm? We are to support, be a, soul, a shoulder to lean on, not a shoulder to lie on. In the story of, of the Good Samaritan, we see a brother helping a brother carry the load. In Luke chapter 10, 30 to 35, we are told a certain man went down to Jericho. And while he was on his way, he fell among thieves. The thieves did what thieves do. They robbed him. They beat him up. And they left him to die. And here is this man, blooded, lying on the ground. And he's about to expire and needs somebody to help him out. And as he's lying there, waiting for somebody to show up, he didn't have his smartphone to dial 911. So here he was, in his own blood. But as he looked through one of these swollen eyes, all of a sudden he saw somebody coming in his direction. As he looked and assessed the situation, because he lying on the ground was a church folk. He was somebody who had been to church, and so he recognized that the person coming was the priest. He is guaranteed a hundred percent that this brother would help him. And so he was now elated on the inside. He was now overjoyed because help is on the way. But then the brother, well, looked over and crossed over to the other side. The 
priest, the pastor. Have mercy, somebody. Oh, my, the priest went on his own way. And so the, uh, the, uh, the beaten up man now was, was plunged again into despair. But then he saw and heard footsteps moving in his direction again as he observed. Now, this was the elder. Was it from Apple Creek? Couldn't be. The elder was heading in his direction. And as soon as the elder got close, the elder took a, a look like the breeze and then crossed over on the other side and went on his way. He thought if he had missed the first train, the pastor, there is no doubt he would have missed the second train, the elder. But the elder also did the same thing. So uh, I can imagine he was about to give up. Mm -hmm. But then he heard footsteps coming. It was, as he, as he gazed in, in the opposite direction, he discovered this was a Samaritan. He knew, as far as he's concerned, this brother is not going to help him. He is a Samaritan. He is not a vegetarian. He doesn't go to church on Sabbath. He is not going to help me. I'm a Jew. He's a Samaritan. He, we call them dogs. But look what happened. The brother walked over, stooped down, cleaned up his mess, got out of his one-seater, his donkey, put him on the donkey, dressed him up, and walked miles into town, checked him in with his own money, paid the bill, and told the innkeeper, if he needs anything else, please, let me know, and I will repay. The priest and Levite had the spirit of Cain. But the Samaritan had the spirit of Christ. In September 2014, President Obama issued a challenge to cities, towns, and counties across the U.S. to become MBK communities. The challenge, ladies and gentlemen, signal a call to action for all members of the communities, mayors in particular, to enact sustainable change through policy programs and, and partnership. The MBK Community Challenge encouraged communities to implement a cradle to college and career strategy initiative for improving the life and outcome of all young people. The President of the United States said that we are our brother's keeper. And he designed a program, an initiative, to take care of those young men who were falling by the wayside. But long before this presidential initiative, God initiated this ministry of accountability. When he provoked us with this question, where is your brother? As Matthew Henry, Matthew Henry puts it, a charitable concern for our brethren as their keepers is a great duty, which is strictly required of us, but is generally neglected by us. Those who are unconcerned in the affairs of their brethren and take no care when they have opportunity to prevent their hurt in their bodies, good name, especially in their souls, do in effect speak Cain's language. When we see people walking around needing help and we do nothing. We are speaking uh, Cain's language. When we see uh, people in our midst who are in need and we turn a blind eye, we are speaking, hear me somebody, Cain's language. So as our brother's keeper, we are called to help carry 
the load to support each other and provide a shoulder to lean on. So I have, I have answered your question. Am I my brother's keeper? I've shared with you our responsibility in being our brother's keeper. And now let me share with you the results of being my brother's keeper. You see, it's, it's, it's the innate desire of every single human being to be seen, heard, and understood. The innate value and desire of every human being. We are created to be with each other. When God created us, he created us within relationship. Our existence rests on our relationship with each other. So if something is not done about Ebola in Africa, by those in North America, you will find out what I'm talking about. We exist in a relationship. We thrive when we build relationship with each other. It's for this reason that, that Solomon tells us in Ecclesiastes 4, 11 and 12, he says, if two lie together, hmm, then they have heat. Can't have heat, young lady, unless you marry and you lie in the same bed together. And there's heat. But so how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. We belong together. When God created Mr. and Mrs. Adam, they enjoyed a relationship. Am I right about it? They enjoyed relationship with each other. But their disobedience, however, led to alienation. We were supposed to be in support of each other. Even after Christ died to redeem us and to restore us from our pre-fallen pre state. But some of us still choose to be alienated from each other. You see, alienation, alienation from, from self. Some of us, we, we have a, a very bad concept of self. Alienation from each other for the perceived hurt that others have caused us. And alienation from God. Alienation from each other only fuels psychopathological conditions. Illnesses of the mind. Mental distress. Fear and shame. But when we become our brother's keeper, when we support each other, when we help each other to carry the load on life's journey, we don't just help to alleviate their struggle. We also help improve our mental and physical health. Now, research has taught us one study done by the California Department of Health Services found that, that, that people who lack social and community ties were at a higher risk of dying from common heart disease, hmm? from stroke, cancer, respiratory diseases, gastrointestinal disease, and all other causes of death. You see, emotional support, which involves verbal and nonverbal communication, Caring and concern helps to provide a sense of purpose and meaning and belonging. So when we show that we care and when we, when we engage others, it gives us a sense of purpose which in turn impacts our mental and our physical health. So it behooves us to reach out and help somebody. So being your brother's keeper... Is good for your brother, but it's also good uh, 
for your mental and physical health. If you're with me, say amen. So this is what I've, I've stopped by here today to tell you. That we are our brother's keeper. As our brother's keeper, we should reach out and make, ladies and gentlemen, and provide, rather, the helping hand that our brothers need. There are health benefits involved in being our brother's keeper. The light up here is shining on my iPad, dazzling my eyes. You see, uh, as individuals, Apple Creek, today I hear, I hear God asking you the same question he asked Cain years ago. I hear God asking, where is your brother? Is he in the hospital? Where is your brother? Is he in a jail somewhere? Where is your brother? Is he in a hopeless, helpless state? Where is your brother? Is he in a crisis? And rather than criticizing and, and saying that's good for him, where is your brother? You see, years ago when I was sinking in my sin, Jesus, Jesus, my brother, did not ignore the question, where is your brother? Instead, he became flesh and he came down here and found me. He found me and he rescued me. And today, uh, today uh, I didn't come by to bother nobody. I came by here to tell somebody that Jesus is alive and we ought to show somebody. We ought to tell somebody. So what should I tell them, preacher? Tell them that Jesus came down through 42 generations and got off in a little town called Bethlehem. Tell them that he lived amongst humankind for 33 years. Tell them that late one Thursday evening in a garden called Gethsemane, he prayed and he was betrayed into the hands of evil men. Tell them they led him from judgment hall to judgment hall. Tell them they whipped him all night long. Don't forget to tell them that one Friday they took Jesus to Calvary. There they nailed his hands and they nailed his feet. Don't forget to tell them they pierced his side. Tell them he died. I said, tell them he died. They placed him in a borrow tomb. Tell them he slept on Friday. Tell them he slept all day Saturday. Tell them he slept all night. Saturday. Tell them early Sunday morning he got up with all power. For all power he says is given to me. Tell them Jesus is alive and he's well and I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. You ask me how I know he's living. He lives within my heart. I don't know about you. Don't know how you feel about that. But I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. Glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. You see, Satan, Satan, he had me bound, but Jesus lifted me. 
Satan had me bound. I don't know about you. Satan had me bound. But Jesus, Jesus lifted me when I was in trouble. Jesus lifted me when I was in trouble. Have you ever been in trouble? Jesus lifted me. When I was in trouble, Jesus lifted me. Glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. He lifted me up from the miry clay and planted my feet and a rock to stay. And that is the reason why I sing and I shout. Thanks be to God. Jesus lifted me. I am my brother's keeper. So the question this morning for us here in the house, Apple Creek, where is your brother? Are you your brother's keeper? Touch two people and tell them, I am my brother's keeper. Are you?